The months-long build-up of Russian troops on the border with Ukraine has turned now into an invasion. Ukraine under attack. Military bases, airports and aircraft have been targeted and bombed. The skies over multiple cities, including the capital Kiev, lit up, waking up residents in the early hours of Thursday as Russian artillery advanced. Not very many could have, uh, you know, predicted that he would be striking at so many multiple targets. The civilian casualties are unknown, though Russia says it will only attack military posts. As a response, Ukraine has declared martial law. I had a conversation with U.S. President Joe Biden. The U.S. is starting to gather international support. Today we need you, each of you, to be calm. If possible, stay at home, please. We are working. The army is working. The entire security and defense sector of Ukraine is working. These attacks come after Russian President Vladimir Putin declared two separatist areas in the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine as independent and said Russian civilians who live there need protection. The battle for Luhansk and Donetsk in eastern Ukraine has been going on since 2014, with more than 14,000 people killed in fighting between Russian-backed separatists and the Ukrainian army. Now Putin has demanded Ukrainian forces retreat. Whoever would try to stop us and further create threats to our country, to our people, should know that Russia's response will be immediate and lead you to such consequences that you have never faced in your history. We are ready for any outcome. The operation began despite last-ditch appeals from members of the UN Security Council to ease tension. Ukraine's ambassador to the UN demanded his Russian counterpart step down as chairman. Call Putin, call Lavrov to stop aggression. There is no purgatory for war criminals. They go straight to hell, ambassador. In a statement, US President Joe Biden warned of a catastrophic loss of life and human suffering. There's a mood of desperation developing now. Many people just jumping into their cars, getting their families together and heading on the road, trying to get to Poland. But the main auto routes are all jammed. There are so many people trying to do the same thing. Others are going underground, taking shelter. The missiles are getting closer now. Emergency meetings have been called to reach an agreement, while the shelling and build-up of military troops on both sides continues. This is Ukraine's darkest day. Andrew Simmons, Al Jazeera, Kiev. Right, let's start talking to our teams on the ground. First, it's Hoda Abdel Hamid. She is in Kramatorsk in eastern Ukraine. Tell us about what you've been seeing and hearing, Hoda. Well, certainly there is a bit of panic among people, actually, while I was standing here waiting to talk to you. One woman came up to me asking me why I was wearing this gear and that we were actually frightening people even more by our presence in this city. Another one came up to me, showed me her credit card and said, there is no more money in the cash machine. There are no dollars, there are no hryvnas, which is a local currency. And she did look, if you looked at her eyes, she did look quite panicked. But the city is calm. Since these morning explosions, the pre-dawn explosions, we haven't heard uh, anything uh, since. However, I'm just going to get out of the shot. You can see all the shops are completely uh, shut down. Businesses, restaurants, everything is shut down. There are people on the street, but this would be a busier time uh, normally, sim simply because we are actually in the city center of uh, Kramatorsk. So people are following the news, people are worried. Um, the bus station that connects the different region is now closed. It's all, the train is also uh, working uh, sporadically, so people's only choice is to try to get into their car and go somewhere, even though, as I said again, danger is still not here, but they are following what's happening at the front line. It's about 90 kilometers away from here. And in certain points, and not many, but the, uh, we believe the, uh, the pro-Russian separatists have managed 
to break through that front line and, and advance. Uh, certainly, we know that in one point along that front line, and we are hearing other reports of that, but we cannot confirm that at the moment because the situation is fluid. There are a lot of rumors and counter rumors, but certainly people uh, are beginning to realize what's happening. It's sinking in and panic is beginning to set really. Hotta, stay there for a sec if you can. Uh, the team's just telling me about some new pictures we've just gotten in. Can we roll those pictures, guys? Uh, Russian tanks uh, apparently coming into Luhansk. Uh, so, yeah, sorry, I'm just running through a few different things here. OK, there you got the tank there. I was waiting for it to come through. OK, so that is a def definitive sign of uh, Russian tanks. I also just want to... Can we take those, show those pictures as well of the uh, of the Russian president just now, just really quickly? Just notice this on some of my screens here. That's the Prime Minister of uh, Pakistan, Imran Khan, who's visiting with uh, Vladimir Putin as well. Not live pictures. This has just come in a moment ago. So uh, Vladimir Putin taking a, a, a foreign minister, a uh, uh, prime minister, in for a visit as well on the day that he has ordered a military operation in a neighbouring country. Lots happening there. Sorry, just wanted to get to all those pictures. Hot Abdul Hamid as well with us uh, from Kramatorsk. Tell us, I, I saw one of your reports earlier as well, Hoda, from one of the uh, supermarkets, wasn't it? Which is, uh, well, the sh shelves rapidly becoming quite bare. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think what happened is that people were quite blasé about it all. Um, you know, over the past few weeks, we've been going around this eastern side, and many uh, had brushed away the idea of an invasion, even as far as Kiev, people had, had brushed out the idea of an invasion. And then sort of the rhetoric ramped up and the threats ramped up, but they still stayed quite a blasé, especially in this part of the country. Now, you have to understand that uh, these cities are quite divided, are quite mixed. You do have the Russia does have a lot of support in many of these cities. Some of them, it's a 50-50. Other ones could be overwhelmingly uh, pro-Russian, and that's what makes it so difficult for the Ukrainian soldiers at the front line. So people did not make their preparations. People did not really believe that all that would happen. And people sort of, those who do support Russia, did do feel safe uh, that if they indeed come here, well, then uh, they would be, they, nothing would happen to them. But then comes the reality, then comes the explosions, then comes the sounds, then comes the pictures, mm. and that starts to frighten people, whether, whether, whatever side they sit on. And I think that's what's been happening here in the city, because I remember around 8, 9 o'clock, we were going live. I was looking around. People were going to their office. Um, they seemed to be going about their normal day. Well, it looks very different at this point in town. Uh, in time um, now there's no there's barely any queue at the ATM simply because there's no more cash there and the streets are empty and the businesses apart from the supermarkets and maybe a, a few kiosks are completely shut down put that all together happening not only in Kramatorsk but in several towns and cities around the eastern Ukraine and th that increases the anxiety among people the uncertainty of what could happen what an extraordinary time it is. Thank you, Hoda Abdelhamid, uh, Kramatorsk, Eastern Ukraine. Now, to one of our other team, and this is Charles Stratford, who is in uh, Mariupol, the port city there. He's been reporting from on the ground. The explosions heard there in that key port city. Have a look at his report. We've heard loud bangs of explosions, and interestingly, it's the first time so far today where we've heard that distinctive sound of grad rockets being used. It's a rapid fire thudding. These are rockets that land in, in, in rapid succession um, and are highly, obviously highly dangerous. The sort of rockets that we saw being used during the 2014-2015 war between the Sepsists and the Ukrainians. Now I'm going to flip the camera around. I don't know whether you're going to be able to see this, but across the field there you may be able to see smoke rising. I suppose for me it's about I don't know, a quarter of a kilometre away or so. We understand that that is a military um, installation. 
that uh, has been hit. Uh, smoke uh, has been billowing from it for about the last hour and a half or so. There's more smoke coming out from what we understand are military installations beyond that, I suppose at about another half a kilometer or so. Um, and here's the sign. And the reason why I'm showing this sign is because it's of significance. The, the, the top word you see there, the town is Meliotopol. And we've been talking earlier today about what analysts say could be an attempt by Russian forces to create a corridor from the Donbass region, the eastern areas uh, held by the separatists to Crimea. OK, that is Ukraine covered off with two correspondents there. Let's flip over to Moscow uh, and bring in Dorsa Jabari, our correspondent there. Is that what we're going to do? Yep, let's talk to Dorsa. Hi, Dorsa. So I'd like you to tell us about what the Russians have been saying separately to the message for the Ukrainian military and the messages to the Ukrainian people. Well, Kamal, we've just been hearing from the Kremlin spokesperson, Dmitry Peskov, who a few minutes ago said that um, the goal is to neutralize the military potential of Kiev. That is officially what Russia is trying to do at the moment. And um, he went on to say that the uh, Kremlin, Kremlin is not excluding the possibility of negotiations between Putin and Zelensky if Ukraine is ready to talk about uh, Moscow security concerns um, and that um, the possible uh, about the accusations that Russia is looking for a possible regime change in Ukraine. And he uh, said that this is a question for um, of choice for of the Ukrainian people. Um, I think this comes at a time when there's been a lot of um, accusations thrown at the government here that they're trying to overthrow the uh, officials in Kiev, who they have accused of being weak in the past. Uh, the President Vladimir Putin had said that um, the Ukrainian president is a puppet of the West, and that is why uh, that this uh, their, their country is in such a state. They're not uh, basically in charge. They're not representing the entire population. Mm. In terms of the message out of here for the Ukrainian people, the Russian defense ministry has said that they are targeting military installations in Ukraine. They are not targeting civilians. Uh, the officials have said that they are not not uh, causing alarm. They don't want to cause alarm to the general population of Ukraine. Of course, it's going to be very difficult because some of those military installations that we've seen already are in heavily populated areas uh, in cities in Ukraine. So uh, we just have to wait and see how this unfolds in the coming hours. We expect Vladimir Putin, who's currently meeting with the prime minister of um, Pakistan, who arrived um, to, in Moscow late last night, to speak to the media following that meeting probably in the next few hours, and we'll see what he has to say. Since he broadcast that message early at 6 a.m. Moscow time, making the announcement that Russia was going into Ukraine to assist with the separatists um, in the eastern part of Ukraine who were fighting with the Ukraine military. Yeah, was that a pre... I'm guessing that was a pre-planned visit by Imran Khan because it seems an odd time to be accepting a, uh, a visit from a world leader when you're basically just gone to war. Absolutely. This was on the calendar for Vladimir Putin from uh, about a week ago or so. And we saw footage of Imran Khan landing in Moscow where he was greeted by officials. And he uh, was um, he said that it's quite an exciting time to be in Moscow, obviously not realizing what was to come in the few hours after that statement. Uh, but we also have, I also have to mention that the, um, there have been a number of flights that have been canceled. Uh, certain areas of Russia's airspace have been closed off to civilian flights as a result of the ongoing operations they're carrying out in Ukraine. Um, and we, they've said that they are closing uh, certain portions of the airspace in the country until March 2nd. Uh, so I think um, this will be certainly the last high-ranking official who will be visiting Vladimir Putin for the foreseeable future. Cool. Thanks, Dorsa. Uh, talk to you again soon. Plenty of condemnation out there today. We'll start with this from the European Union Foreign Policy Chief Joseph Borrell, who's spoken alongside the EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen there in Brussels. These are among the darkest hours for Europe since the end of World War II. A major nuclear power has attacked a neighbour country 
and is threatening reprisals of any other states that may come to its rescue. This is not only the greatest violation of international law, it's a violation of the basic principles of human coexistence. It's costing many lives with unknown consequences ahead of us. Later today, we will present a package of massive and targeted sanctions to European leaders for approval. With this package, we will target strategic sectors of the Russian economy by blocking their access to technologies and markets that are key for Russia. We will weaken Russia's economic base and its capacity to modernize. And in addition, we will freeze Russian assets in the European Union and stop the access of Russian banks to European financial, financial markets. Until early this morning, some here in Kiev doubted that he would do it. Not anymore. The West warned Vladimir Putin was about to attack. He said he had no such plans. That fiction now utterly exposed. Explosions right across this vast country. In Ivano Frankivsk, in the far southwest, a missile struck an airport. Unverified images from Ukraine's northern and southern borders seem to show columns of Russian armor entering from Belarus and Crimea. Within hours, Russian tanks were reported to be on the streets of Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv. Whatever Russia says, this attack will not be surgical. To the east of Kharkiv, emergency workers battle to control fires in residential buildings hit by rockets. The number of civilian casualties is rising. At Mariupol in the south, another airport on fire. This country's civilian infrastructure is being heavily struck. There are no more flights in or out. A glance at the map shows a country under attack from east to west, north to south. Earlier, a snarling Russian leader said this was all in self-defense and warned Ukrainians to lay down their arms. We will strive for the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine. Russia cannot feel safe, develop and exist with a constant threat emanating from the territory of modern Ukraine. In Kiev, Ukraine's embattled president, who must now fear for his job, appeal to the world. Putin started a war against Ukraine, against the whole democratic world. He wants to destroy my country. He wants to destroy our country, everything we have been building, what we live for. So far, all the signs are that this attack is working out exactly the way Western leaders have been warning for weeks. The country is being attacked from all directions, and the fear now has to be that some of those Russian troops are heading here to the capital. Some people aren't waiting to find out what happens next. The roads out of Kiev jammed with traffic, most of it heading west. These people don't want to be liberated by Vladimir Putin. After weeks of extraordinary calm, this suddenly looks like panic. Mid-morning and two jets fly over the city. It's not clear whose. But it seems only a matter of time before Russia controls the air and much besides. Paul Adams, BBC News, Kyiv. Well, people here in Kyiv woke to the sound of air raid sirens up above as citizens who'd long prayed for peace now had to face war. My colleague Nick Beek has been gauging the thoughts of some of the people here to the extraordinary unfolding events. The invasion, the attack that Russia promised would never happen has now started and the Ukrainian government is urging people to stay calm 
and it's appealing to the international community to stop President Putin now. We soon find Lana and her mum. Russia forced them from their home in Crimea eight years ago. Now they're on the move again. It's very, very nervous and uh, I'm very scared, but uh, I, I, uh, I might be strong. After the overnight attacks from the skies, many are taking refuge underground. Well, this feels like one of the safest places in the city today, not just because there are lots of soldiers about, but because the metro is doubling up as a bomb shelter. And overnight families have come down here. They're trying to follow the news of what's happening and they're trying to work out what they're going to do next. Two-year-old Yegor is still smiling, but his mum and dad are worried. Eight bombs. Eight bombs. Eight bombs. At a Boris Nepal. In English. This is a war start. I'm very, very scared for my boy, Alexander says. Then both parents ask, where are NATO to help us? When the bombs started falling, sales manager Mark helped his neighbours leave their homes. He tells me he's now ready to fight on the front line and die for his country. It's only one way uh, to uh, serve our uh, country, our uh, children, our mo mothers, and uh, defend our country fr uh, from Russian occupation. Uh, and uh, we will fight uh, all day. Many are fearful of what will come next. Among them, Alexei. If Russia will occupy Kiev, which I don't believe happen, because I believe in our army, well, it will be like uh, another Nazi occupation. It's still eerily quiet here in the heart of the capital. It seems many have followed government advice to stay at home. Lots of people will have also heard Russia's claim that it carried out targeted strikes on the Ukrainian military. I've got to tell you, people here are saying it doesn't feel like that to them. Instead, they feel that they're under attack and that President Putin has declared war on them. Nick Beek, BBC News, Kyiv the view from here in Ukraine. Well, what about Russia? In an address on state television, Vladimir Putin claimed his country had been left no choice but to defend itself against what he suggested were threats from modern Ukraine and that Moscow would try to what he called denazify this country. From Moscow, Steve Rosenberg. From the president of Russia, a fateful decision. Vladimir Putin said military operation, but really the Kremlin was launching a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Russian stocks plunged, the ruble hit an all-time low. Fears of conflict superseded by the shock of a war and what may come next. I think that if Putin is not stopped now in Ukraine, this war uh, would be the beginning of the Third World War. Vladimir Putin comes across now as a leader with an almost messianic idea to force Ukraine back into Moscow's orbit, even if that means war. What the public might think about that doesn't come into it. He seems determined to achieve his goal. In the centre of Moscow, we're against the war, she says, and we want the whole world to know that. But so far, few Russians have come out to protest. Maybe this is why. In Russia now, protests end like this. I'm sorry, I'm so shocked. I just can't help crying. I think that most of Russians don't support this. It's horrible. And why don't they support it? Because uh, it's uh, not our war, it's war Putin, Biden or anyone else, but not our nation. I think the Ukrainian soldiers will surrender, she says, and they should. It's terrible to be at war with Ukraine. This is not a conflict the Russian public wants. This is the Kremlin's war. Steve Rosenberg, BBC News, Moscow. Let's talk to our 
Eastern Europe correspondent Sarah Rainsford, who's uh, in eastern Ukraine. Sarah, the front line in Russia's quarrel over the last eight years with Ukraine has been where you are in the east. What's the picture looking like now? line could be moving, that uh, if Ukrainian forces have been battling pro-Russian, Russian-backed forces for the past eight years and kept that line pretty much in place, now those militias are backed by the Russian army. Uh, we know that they've rolled into some areas of the Donbass and we know that there is uh, some heavy fighting going on along the, the contact line, as it's known, uh, to the south of where I am now. Uh, we know there have been civilians killed today in one area and uh, that there's, there's, as I say, heavy fighting in several places. So people here uh, back a little way from the, the front line are worried about what that means. They're worried about an advance by Russian troops. They're worried about the fighting coming to their doorstep. For the moment, uh, life is kind of going on as normal. There are children out and about. There are parents uh, with babies. Uh, people have gone to work today, although school was cancelled. Uh, but there's this kind of air of trepidation about what is coming because people have seen what happens when this area is taken over by the Russian-backed militias before. Now it's the Russian army who's there too, and they're worried about what exactly that means for, for their lives going forward. Russia has launched a military assault on Ukraine, hitting targets across the country. U.S. President Joe Biden has condemned the attack as unjustified and unprovoked. Here in Germany, Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock has just said if the world does not respond, we will pay an even higher price. Russian President Vladimir Putin announced the move in an unscheduled TV address shortly before 6 a.m. in Moscow. He said he'd been left with no choice because of the threat emanating from Ukraine. Within minutes, explosions were reported in numerous places, including the southern port cities of Odessa and Mariupol, as well as Kramatorsk and Kharkiv in the east, the Dnipro in central Ukraine and the capital, Kiev. DW's Fanny Facha is in the capital, Kiev. Fanny, what a night, what a morning for people there. What is the situation like in Kiev where you are? Actually, it is worsening in terms of the announcement that are being made right now by the Ukrainian government. The U.S. president is uh, basically taking everything to social media, trying to inform people there. The Ukrainian defense minister says everyone who is able to hold a weapon is basically called upon to join the defense forces. That clearly underlines what's been already analyzed over the course of the past weeks, that Ukrainians' military forces are in inferior compared to Russia's military. Now, we do not know how the situation is going to further escalate, but let me tell you, as we woke up to the uh, explosions this morning, that really was a shock to many here. People in Kyiv didn't think, even to the last minute, that actually Russia is going to go so far as a, a, a assaulting Kyiv, the capital city. After also, after all, also Vladimir Putin pointed out in this surprised televised, surprising televised address this morning that this is, quote, a military operation in eastern Ukraine. But it turns out there are various reports that explosions are heard in many parts of the country, shellings and uh, reports of people being injured and killed. Now, the problem is we cannot verify this information, so I'm not even going to uh, talk about any numbers at this point, because as this escalation has entered a new phase, 
There are various accusations between uh, Russian forces and Ukrainian uh, government official military information. What is actually currently happening on the ground? I can only tell you, in fact, what I've been experiencing this morning. And that was a very, very critical situation. People here were packing up, trying to leave uh, by car from the hotel where we are at this point. Also, we are hearing that there are a lot of people lined up at gasoline stations trying to fill up on gas, trying to leave to neighboring uh, countries, Slovakia, Poland, towards the west. But we also hear at this point, if you're trying to leave Kyiv, it's in fact almost impossible to go towards the west. So much traffic, traffic has built up. Again, there are also people who are just staying put and are trying to uh, inform themselves actually where is the nearest shelter when those sirens are going to uh, go off again, likely as they did this morning, siren warning or in fact telling people this is the time that you should look for your closest shelter. And these are similar reports that we're getting funny from our other correspondents in the country, also from family and friends, personal messages I've been getting from uh, uh, different parts of the country, central parts of the country, in Dnipro, for example, waking up to these explosions. Uh, could you tell us the Ukrainian president announced he was introducing martial law? What does that entail? Martial law is usually introduced in, in, in times of crisis that could be, uh, could be a natural disaster uh, situation uh, of conflict or a war. So what is happening is basically the natural way of things as uh, they proceed in any uh, democratic country to say so, to implement martial law, by that also implying to the citizens here that this is not the time that they should venture out, but they should actually stay put, stay at home, stay inside, look for the closest shelter uh, position and just remain also so calm because this is actually the concern here that people will start to panic even more and then what how you how can you secure critical infrastructure that is needed to protect actually citizens and to protect uh, people from a uh, from a uh, increasing escalation so military law, uh, martial law uh, rather is implemented because it can no longer be maintained or guaranteed that the civilian government law that is in, in place normally can guarantee the security of citizens. This is when the military takes over, usually setting up checkpoints. We haven't seen it just yet here in the city centre, but it's likely to happen. Military checkpoints, checking exit, uh, uh, exiting uh, streets uh, from uh, Kiev, checking people who uh, are on the street. What documents do they carry? Are they actually supposed to be on the street? It's also a uh, law by which um, the uh, government can uh, sort of make sure and impose that people do not gather that they really stay put and stay at home. Exactly, and, and not be on the move. I was asked this morning uh, about an 84-year-old man. Uh, how do we get him out of Ukraine? The, the uh, problem is at the moment uh, moving and to stay put is the safest option, as you say. Um, tell us what else uh, Zelensky has been saying today. Zelensky made clear what he believes is not just a military operation, as uh, Russia's President Vladimir Putin announced early this morning, but he says he expects, basically, that Russia wants to destroy Ukraine. Now, these are, of course, very strong words. And people here are hoping on the ground that it's not going to go as far as uh, as far as a full scale, full fledged invasion of the entire country. Ukraine's President Zelensky wants to maintain a self-confidence. In fact, the spokesperson of his presidency also made clear there is no panic in the presidency. Speaking to people on the ground, they wonder when somebody says there is no panic, whether that actually means there is going to be panic. Mm. But overall, what Ukraine tries to maintain, as they did also over the course of the past days, as the escalation started to enter a new level, to maintain that this is a democratic, independent, sovereign country, and they're not going to give up on any land. They will not have any foreign entity to uh, take over here and uh, rule this country. Now, we are not so far yet, but there is, of course, concern here on the ground, especially because so many things have happened over the course of the uh, past couple of days that were highly unlikely that at this point, everything is likely. Fanny, thank you very much for your reporting. Uh, the, the, the story itself is moving so fast. Let's have a listen in now to what the Ukrainian president has been saying. Dear Ukrainians, this morning, President Putin announced a special military operation in the Donbas. 
Russia carried out strikes on our military infrastructure, on our border guards. Explosions were heard in many cities of Ukraine. We are introducing martial law throughout the state. I have had a conversation with President Biden. The US is gathering international support. Today we need each of you, each of you to be calm. If possible, stay at home, please. We are working, the army is working. The entire security and defense sector of Ukraine is working. I, the National Security and Defense Council, the government will be in touch. Soon I will be in touch again. Don't panic. We are strong. We are ready for everything and we will defeat anyone. Because we are Ukraine. Glory to Ukraine. Ukrainian president trying to keep the calm there. Uh, Fanny, back to you. Um, tell us more about the developments happening there and the mood there in the capital. Supermarkets are being closed. In fact, everything uh, that is... Uh normally considered essential is closed, except gasoline stations that clearly indicates for you that more unfortunately may come. And those people who decided to leave today, they do not want to just wait here and see what else to come. They really want to flee towards the West. So neighboring countries like Slovakia, Poland are expecting an influx of uh, refugees actually from Ukraine. Really, as I'm saying, the, all of this, uh, even me, I didn't think just a week ago it's going to happen this fast, that here in the capital city, in Kyiv, people are going to have to make this decision about to stay or leave. Now, you have to know that the border with Belarus is just to the north, 200 kilometers from here. Ukraine said that the explosions, in fact, those that we have heard this morning, that was initiated from Belarus, what Belarus said, they never participated in any uh, military support with that regard uh, or assault uh, and, and support of Russian troops. This is the problem at this point. A lot of things are blurry in terms of who where things originate from, what we can see, of course, that the aggression from Russian troops is going beyond the region of Donbass, uh, way beyond the, the border of Donbass. And the question really is just how far and how intense uh, this, uh, what's being called an invasion, is going to continue and what that will uh, trigger in terms of uh, Ukrainians uh, panicking and what that panic actually means for security here on the ground. What it sounds like there is uh, the development of an information war, the sowing of mistrust and confusion. Thank you very much for your reporting again from Kiev. And our correspondent Nick Connolly has arrived in the eastern town of Zaknovshina, near Ukraine's second biggest city, Kharkiv. Nick, what's happening where you are? We've got Nick on the line. Well, this is a region that is very close to Donbass, about 150 kilometers from uh, the administrative capital of the Ukrainian held on the Tost, we decided to lots of uh, explosions today and also about 100 kilometers away from Kharkiv, Ukraine, the second biggest city that lies very close to that Russian border. Um, I got off the train, we kind of the dawn was breaking, and we saw people just looking day in and days and kind of confusing their phones, not quite believing that this was finally happening after weeks and months of headlines, that it all seemed a bit unreal. And then within a few hours, you saw people kind of getting their heads around the news and trying to react. People are standing in line outside the banks trying to get cash out. Um, I think the, the supply of cash ran up pretty soon. Same goes for uh, petrol stations, fuel for cars is a big issue. Um, we've seen some Ukrainian military uh, tech hardware out on the streets, some uh, anti aircraft, what seem to be anti aircraft uh, missile systems and stations basically in the countryside outside big cities. Um, and also, I also spoke to some people from the emergency services from the fire brigade who were being called up to head to Donbass for them, stocking up on food and petrol and uh, basically preparing themselves for, I guess, uh, 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 some uh, engagements that they'd never really um, thought that as you know, fire brigade uh, servicemen and women or emergency that have to have ever have to really confront. It sounds like a similar reaction to what Funny was just reporting from the capital. But of course, you're so much close to uh, where a great deal of the action is, uh, Nick. I, I guess the mood there is is uh, one of much more urgency. Well, on the other hand, 
you have to remember that you know, small towns people often don't have the resources, just you know, financial resources to go anyway. You know, the middle class citizens here are more likely to have dollars and euros and uh, connections abroad and some kind of option to leave the country. Here, lots of people told me that they were just going to try their best to stitch it out. Although, you know, people in small villages and towns don't have any particular bomb shelters to go to, they maybe have a cellar, but that's not really very deep and runs the risk of having their own house full on top of them. Um, so there was a kind of stoic acceptance of the situation. People, uh, some people were telling me that they were annoyed with themselves that they hadn't stocked up on food or cash, um, as had been recommended in previous weeks. But no panic, as, as you heard earlier. People, yes, trying to queue, trying to get stuff, but not losing their nerve, not shouting each other, keeping their calm. And I think that is just down to the fact that this country has been through more for eight years, especially here in this part of the country that is close to that Donbass region, has seen military casualties on a regular basis. This is not something people are seeing for the first time. Yes, it's on a far bigger scale. It's coming from all different directions, and that's going to be the biggest problem for Ukraine's forces to deal with those attacks coming from Belarus, coming from Russia north of Kiev and from the east and from Annex Crimea. Although, as you also heard, questions about the reports coming in, how much of that is actually Russian information warfare, an attempt to intimidate Ukraine with fakes. It's obviously very difficult to try and verify the video we're seeing online of various attacks to actually be sure that the locations are those that are being given. Um, but certainly hours of extraordinary stress here in Ukraine, but no sign that you know, average Ukrainians are really losing their heads and panicking for now. Nick, um, we've been reporting on the build-up of troops along the borders over the past days and weeks, and now we're hearing reports this morning of these explosions and incursions in various spots in the south, uh, in the east, where you are, also in central parts of the country and in the capital. Um, can you give us more of an idea of exactly what's going on? And based on information that is available to me online, and uh, as I said, it's very difficult to verify, it does seem like there is a big offensive going on in Donbass, particularly in the Luhansk region. Um, Ukrainian sources saying that the Ukrainian military was actually able to uh, rebuff some of those attacks and regain territory being temporarily lost. That's not verified. There are also some reports of uh, Russian pressure coming near Kharkiv, the Ukraine's second biggest city, 50 comes from the border. Um, some reports, even of some Russian force in Kharkiv, although that um, remains to be seen if that's actually um, accurate. Then uh, reports coming from Crimea, annex Crimea in the south. There are even reports of Russian uh, military activity coming from the Black Sea in Odessa, another major city on the Black Sea coast, Ukraine's main port. Um, it's all very difficult to verify uh, right now, but it does seem like the jump in this is very, very wide. But just to give you a sense of quite how difficult this is going to be, Ukraine has a 2,000 kilometer long border with Russia, and with Belarus, it has a further 1,000 kilometer border. Now that we heard from NATO and the satellite images of Russian troops in Belarus on so called exercises in recent weeks, and they've been saying there are about 30,000 Russian troops in Belarus. The Belarusian border is very, very close to Kiev. This is a very, um, basically, this is Kiev's back, back, backyard. Unless that border has been marked or particularly defended. So that is going to be an incredible source of vulnerability for Ukrainian leadership trying to keep operations in Kiev. Um, I think this is, this is kind of a, a campaign that no one really wanted to see coming. Everyone was expecting at worst an intensification of fire in Donbass, in the regions that have already been living with war, war for the past eight years. But to see Ukraine, you know, on the entirety of its borders under attack, that was something that no one really wanted to. OK, Nick Connolly, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, the line's starting to get a little fuzzy. Thank you very much for your reporting uh, from the east of the country there on the ground. We're now joined by Artis Fabrix. He is the Defence Minister of Latvia. Welcome. Share some of your thoughts with us. What's going through your head when you see what's happening in Ukraine this morning? Well, in Latvia, in Hansestadt, Riga, in Baltic countries, of course, all our hearts and minds are with uh, Ukrainians because we understand very much what they are enduring now. Because what we know is that Russians are attacking Ukraine from three sides, which means from the land side of Russian-Ukrainian border, from the sea side uh, of the Black Sea, as well as there are intercourses from the Belarusian side, since Belarus is a part of already a Russian uh, operative area. Additionally, we know that there are also diversion groups sent into the Ukraine. And of course, we all know that uh, Russians are bombing cities and bombing other places with 
different type of uh, missile systems. So this is what we know. Uh, we also uh, are looking forward very much to the discussions in NATO and European Union about the next steps which should be taken. Because unfortunately, our analysis in the Baltic countries, in Poland and Sweden, and also in Washington, appear to be very correct. And at this moment, we have only one chance. First, we must uh, start immediate and massive sanctions against aggressor state of Russia. Secondly, we must provide Ukrainian army and Ukrainian population with massive aid so they can prevail. This is the only way uh, where we can still say that, uh, you know, uh, that blood of Ukrainians will not be also on our hands because our duty, our moral duty is to assist with humanitarian aid, with lethal aid. And I hope that finally also those people which we call Ruslan Tverster or appeasers will finally understand how wrong they have been in their assessments about Kremlin's intention. Minister, you say Ukraine is being attacked from three sides which underscores the reports we're coming, uh, that are coming into us and from our correspondents and people on the ground. Uh, how would you then describe uh, this invasion by Russia? I is it an attack on the east or is it an attack on Ukraine as a whole? It's an attack on Ukraine as a whole. It's very obvious. There is a, um, full information available because bombings are going also as far as the very western border of Ukraine. So simply Putin's regime and Russia is trying to put Ukrainians on knees. And of course, this is also a very, very important lesson for all of us uh, which are observing now this uh, mad war waged by Kremlin. And you say that full sanctions are needed. Are we going to get those full sanctions from the EU as well as its partners? Well, as far as it depends on our government and our position, we are ready to do anything to stop this aggressor. And I hope that governments in Berlin and Paris and London will just do the same. Because if you don't do this, if they don't do this, then the price in future will rise with every hour and every day. Are you ready to pay that? I know I, I wouldn't be, that's for sure. Minister, you also said the second thing that's important is providing aid to Ukraine. Is Ukraine getting enough support from, for example, Germany? Um, I don't think there can be too much support to Ukraine, just like there can't be too much of sanctions. And uh, I would once more use this chance of uh, Deutsche Welle to appeal to German society. Please open your eyes. Please also allow Ukrainians to receive a lethal aid because the situation is totally different than it was before. And Germany is the largest European country. It's time to act for you now because from you depends a lot. What's your message to the Ukrainian people? We've heard from the president saying to not panic uh, and from our correspondent in Kiev who was saying uh, it's best to stay put right now and not uh, mobilise, not be uh, on the streets. What's your message to the people there? Well, it's very difficult to give an advice when you are not a Ukrainian yourself at this moment. But, uh, of course... Um, we see that Ukrainians trust uh, their country and they are brave people. And we keep fingers crossed that you will prevail, you will endure, and you will be capable to defend your freedoms. And as much as it depends uh, from such countries as mine and probably many others, we will do as much as possible to help you. At the end, the right thing always wins and the right side is on your side. But actually, I have not only a message to Ukrainians, I would write, really would like to appeal also to Russians, because they are misled by their leadership. And do you really, as the Russian soldiers, are ready to kill your Sla Slavonic brothers, your Ukrainians, just because somebody is sending you uh, to this country? It's a very wrong thing. You are not defending Russia, you are simply defending an aggressor. There are so many people on both sides of the border with family and friends in Ukraine, in Russia. Uh, a very pertinent message there from Latvia's Defence Minister, Artis Vapriks. Thank you very much for being on the show. Dankeschön.
And I'm here with DW's Chief International Editor, Richard Walker. Richard, uh, a lot happening as we've been reporting. Uh, <coughs> talk us through what we know at this moment. Well, as we've been hearing from our reporters on the ground, I mean, what we are witnessing is pretty much the worst case scenario, which uh, the Americans in particular have been warning of uh, with greater and greater urgency in recent weeks. Um, that Vladimir Putin, with this recognition of these um, uh, separatist regions in eastern Ukraine earlier this week, that uh, he wasn't going to stop there, that that was actually the prelude to, to something much, much larger. Um, and it does seem to be all-out total invasion of Ukraine, um, with the goal, as Putin said himself in his, um, in his address overnight, um, the demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine and press for bringing to justice those who have committed numerous bloody crimes. Um, that is a signal that, I mean, his goal is to remove the government, uh, to install presumably a government that, um, that he favours. He said that it is not his goal, it's not his objective to... Um, remain in Ukraine um, to, uh, in the long term. But he also has said in the past, in recent weeks, that his goal is not to uh, invade Ukraine. So it's not at all clear whether we can take that at face value. And this notion of demilitarization and denazification uh, of Ukraine, um, it, it frames Ukraine as a threat to Russia, uh, which um, is a pretty hard case to make if you look at the objective facts. Yeah. And denazification of Ukraine. Also, it, it, this is Putin's position has essentially been that Ukraine has been taken over by illegitimate nationalists and Nazis. If you look at Vladimir Zelensky, he's a democratically elected leader who happens also to be Jewish, uh, who lost ancestors in the Holocaust. So there is an offensive element to what uh, he said there. But if we take that as what Putin is now saying to his people on this day, that's what we're looking at. This is total war aimed at um, regime change, essentially, toppling the government. That said, what do you see happening in the coming hours? Do you expect Ukraine to launch a counteroffensive? <clears throat> well, Ukraine is already saying that it's fighting back, but, but it is, um, and of course, it will be able to inflict uh, some... Uh, casualties, and it is claiming already to have shot down a, a number of, um, of Russian planes. Um, but the Ukrainian army simply and the Ukrainian military is not a match for the force that we've seen assembled here by Vladimir Putin. This is what lay behind the warnings that we've seen in recent weeks, is the scale of this force, the number of battalions that, that Vladimir Putin has moved to the north, to the east, to the south, completely surrounding Ukraine on three sides. Um, so it is doubtful that the Ukrainians will be able to stand up to this onslaught for very long. So then it becomes a question, uh, essentially, of what happens next. Um, looking at this from the outside world, the Western world has, also, uh, has obviously done as much as it felt it could do to deter this from taking place with threatening sanctions um, and already imposing some sanctions after the recognition of, of these regions early in the week. But also by bringing in troops themselves to neighbouring countries. That's true. So, but of course that's another level. That's not going to protect Ukraine. That's about protecting countries like Latvia. And it was very interesting, of course, and compelling to hear La uh, the Defence Minister of Latvia just now speaking to us. Um, those countries um, are the front line of NATO defences. Ukraine um, is not going to receive any Western troops uh, to defend it. So it's, in, in military terms, it's standing alone. It has received um, a certain amount of weapons in recent weeks um, from uh, Western countries, not including Germany, and that's caused a lot of discussion about, about Germany's responsibilities. Um, but in terms of actual troops on the ground, that's not going to happen. Joe Biden's been very clear about that, and of course that would present the risk uh, of a confrontation directly between uh, the two superpowers, the US and Russia, and that could lead to um, yeah, a, a very even more serious war. Obviously. On the topic of Germany, uh, we saw Germany come to the table as far as sanctions go and really pull out that big card uh, with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, uh, putting that on hold, that project, um, which will hurt both sides, uh, but really hurt Russia. Uh, financially, but as far as helping out on the uh, weapons front, uh, do you expect that something uh, that 
topic to be uh, raised here in Germany today. Well, certainly that, that debate is not going away. I mean, Olaf Scholz, the German uh, chancellor, has been uh, doing the rounds of television interviews this week, explaining the move since the uh, recognition of those regions. We're also expecting to hear from him in about an hour, I think, so it'll be interesting to see what he says then. Uh, so far, he's very much stuck to his line that providing weapons is not what uh, Germany wants to do. Um, and there are various arguments that he uses to back that up. Um, but just this morning, a very senior member of the Green Party was calling for uh, Germany to go further. Uh, the Green Party has generally been more hawkish in the course of this um, crisis so far. Uh, it has had a long-standing, very critical view of Russia, the, the direction that Russia has been going in. Um, and there are various voices around other political parties also calling for, for um, weapons to be supplied. Um, I would assume that um, the government is going to stay with this line. The reality is that supplying weapons to, the, to Ukraine at this point is unlikely to change uh, the situation on the ground. In effect, weapon supplies, the, the, if weapon supplies were going to achieve anything, it would have been more as a deterrent effect to try to um, make it clear to Vladimir Putin uh, that he couldn't just walk in and take Ukraine easily. Um, and it's obviously too late, too late for that now. Um, but there is a really intense debate beginning in Germany really since the beginning of this week when Vladimir Putin announced his recognition of these leaders about whether Germany's whole attitude to Russia in the last in recent decades, and especially since um, uh, the annexation of Crimea in 2014, has simply been completely wrong-headed, uh, based on wishful thinking that uh, Russia was a country that could be engaged with, that Russia was a country that could be kind of coaxed into a, into a more uh, democratic and, and liberal and peaceful attitude to the world. Um, and I'd like to draw attention to one really extraordinary intervention by the chief of the German army writing on his LinkedIn page just a couple of hours ago, um, absolutely condemning um, what he sees as a, as a lack of investment in the military, um, saying that he's fed up, that the army has, uh, is, uh, has, is essentially standing empty-handed when looking at the options that it could provide uh, to... Um, to supporting uh, uh, other members of the NATO alliance, for instance, supporting uh, Latvia and other countries that are now feeling a greater threat. Um, so a really extraordinary outburst there by, um, by the head of the German army, indicating that he views that Germany and German politics have simply underestimated the threat from Russia for many years now. DW's chief international editor, Richard Borker, thank you very much for the analysis.